Hello, a big warm welcome to everybody joining this Aqua 360 Digital Water Transition Roundtable Forum. I'm Dr. Kate Baker and I'm a research fellow in the Centre for Water Systems at the University of Exeter. I really hope you've been enjoying the conference so far. It's been uh, really exciting and one of the benefits of having these online conferences is that it's incredibly international. It's great to see faces, colleagues from all around the world uh, joining us. So now uh, we've got a great lineup for you today. Um, the digitization of the water sector has been presented as a promising opportunity to enhance the effectiveness and efficiency of water management. Today, we are bringing together the world leading experts to share the insights of the state of the art digital water practice. Now we're gonna have a mix of uh, short presentations and panel discussions to discuss the challenges and opportunities related to technologies, policies, and engagement with communities. Now, my colleague, uh, Brett, is my tech person. He's going to be helping me today. Um, he's going to be posting the full agenda. He's posting a, a link there that will give you an overview. We have a comfort break at 1.30 UK time, and we will wrap up uh, by 2.30. Now, I know your microphones are muted, um, and... You know, that doesn't mean we, re we really want to hear from you. Um, so please do use the comment, um, you know, say hello. Um, where are you joining us from today? Um, I'm joining you guys from Cornwall in the southwest of England. It's surprisingly sunny for England. Um, so that's rather nice. But yeah, do say hello uh, to each other. If you've got any technical difficulties, then please contact Brett. Um, don't sit in silence, do you just drop a message and say if you've got any problems. Um, now speakers, panelists who are all in the green room, I'm going to be really strict on time because we are trying to pack in a lot in this panel discussion. So um, please, yeah, do, do uh, be concise. Now um, we are rejigging, after saying I've, I've We've got an agenda. We're rejigging the agenda. We're going to um, start with the panel discussion and then we're going to go after that into the uh, keynote. So we've got 30 minutes uh, now to discuss the standardization, data, and innovation of the digital water transition. Now, this is a great opportunity to ask some of the world leading experts in this area. So do, um, do post your questions. Um, we're going to be using uh, Mural. And my colleague is uh, gonna be dropping a link in the chat to the mural. If you take a bit of time to get to, to know this mural, um, if you click on the link, you'll see that there are um, different questions there and the little notes, they're kind of like sticky notes. So you can double click on the sticky note and um, you'll be able to ask your question. If you feel uncomfortable in using Mural, then do use the Q&A. Um, but the reason why we're using the Mural is to try and uh, keep everything in one place so we can uh, document everything and we can review it afterwards. Um, right, so I'm going to introduce the speakers and then they will have three minutes um, to sort of explain and unpack their question. So we've got uh, Dr. Tassos Karatosis, who's a senior researcher at the Center, the Center for Research and Technology in Hellas. His research interests include decision support systems, multimedia analysis, ontologies, and somatic information modeling and reasoning. We've got Dr. Frank Legal, who is CEO of EasyChair Global Market who provide research and engineering solutions and services to accelerate the time to market of new information technologies. We've got Eito Cochero, who is, the, who is a semantic web architect and data scientist. He's a project manager uh, and researcher at Eurocat Technology Center. And finally, we've got Dr. Valerie Naidu, who is the executive manager for business development and innovation at the Water Research Commission in South Africa, where she is leading innovative water research and development initiatives. Now, each speaker is gonna have three minutes um, to talk about the existing challenges to do with standardization, data, and innovation of the digital water transition. And as I said, do 
comment uh, and respond using the mural, or if you feel uncomfortable with the mural, then uh, do ask questions in the chat. Um, now, first off, we've got Tassos. So you've got three three minutes, Tassos. Um, oh, so over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, well, what I'm going to discuss with you today is how we can support the water companies, the water authorities, the water uh, industries to integrate new and innovative solutions into their infrastructures and policies. Uh, actually, we coordinate and um, uh, a European Horizon 2020 project called Aqua 3S, which has to do exactly with this issue, how to support safety and security of drinking water and how we can standardize or at least contribute to relevant standards with new innovative solutions. And the experience in uh, our project so far um, has shown that uh, each authority, each drinking company, each infrastructure are using Absolutely. different policies in all over Europe. Different policies, different um, infrastructures, different uh, guidelines to integrate new sensors or other solutions. So, what we are proposing here, and uh, we think it's very crucial, is to try to standardize not only how you can integrate by a technological point of view a new solution, for example, Earth observation, drone data, um, social media data, together with existing sensors. But the most important is to create the methods, the, so, the pilots, and the whole assessment roadmap in order to be sure that everyone who is involved in this um, new integration, in the integration of new solutions will be on the same page. So we have different type of companies from very small to very large, but we have to be sure that everyone should follow similar approaches in order to be sure that the new solutions for safety and security of drinking water will be at least reliable and valid. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon. So I'm Franck Legal, CEO at AGM, so a French SME. We are involved in several of the ongoing uh, research projects on water, namely Aquas 3S that uh, Tassos was just introducing, Fireware for Water, or Lotus, which is a project with uh, with India. Um, and in these projects, we, we are struggling or dealing with uh, deploying interoperable solutions. Uh, and the question is, when we mean solutions, what do we need to interoperate with? Um, we are using specification standards, um, but the question arises uh, that often when we speak about data interoperability, we think about data models. So what is a water tank? What is a water pump? What is a dissolved oxygen sensor and how to represent it? But this is only one part of the story. Uh, because at some point, we need to, to be able to exchange these uh, interoperable uh, data sets that we, we define. And for that, we also need um, some, um, some interoperable interfaces. It can be race interfaces, MQTT interfaces. There are different types of interfaces. But we, we need to, to agree on, on how we exchange this information. So to really build plug and play uh, new, new solutions. And more and more, what we, we we see coming now is that we we have raw data which is collected, exchanged through some interfaces, but we we need to go one bit one step further and uh, put some uh, some smart models uh, consuming this uh, this information and producing new and rich information. So this is, for example, with machine learned model, AI, and so on. And now what we, we are looking at is um, how to deploy easily these new models. And do we need also some interoperable way or interoperable process to, to deploy these, these models? So this is part of, uh, of this is my question. So please fulfill uh, the, the mural, put your comments, questions. Do you, on your side, need interoperability on the data model, on the interface, 
on the exchange of, uh, of deployment of new processes. None of them, all of them. So please uh, fill the mural for that. Thank you. Okay, and now I am Hydro Corchera. I'm from, from Eurocat and also be part of 504 Watch and IADES. <clears throat> and also, uh, I, and also I, I am part of uh, the ICT for Water uh, cluster as a as a as a, in the board in the stand, standardization of interoperability. And uh, related with that and related with a question that France also launched to all of you is just the term of a uh, different uh, water infrastructure is living with a lot of standards in the different part of the value chain. These different standards are some kind vendor lock, some kind they have their own interest and we are willing to uh, to see or to, to distill what is the interoperability level of your company just to try to share data across your company, to expo expose the data, to explore this data throughout the different parts of the, of the, of the, of the value chain, also to, in the view of how to share data across different weather companies just to, um, to tackle better decisions, to enhance the decision systems, etc. So this, uh, we are willing in the question also to see or identify what is the most standardized uh, common data models, common stand, standard models just to represent this information. We know there is a lot of coming from different projects that we have it also on the Horizon 2020, but we we are also interested in on which data models use the companies, which are operational data models that we have it there, or also semantic models, if, if, if any, if it is used. And for that, we are well, interested just to discuss this, to, to try to break these silos that are uh, performing the companies and that just to, to, to see how we can help on that and how we can uh, support on, on, on this adoption of new data uh, paradigms just to, 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 to share and explore data uh, automatically for, uh, for integration of the... My, my question, we are very happy just to to, to see all the responses, if, if, if any, just to discuss all of you, uh, this semantic interoperability uh, uh, layers and how the, these data models can bring to, to your company uh, newer, newer insights and newer uh, opportunities for, for artificial, intelli artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is uh, Valerie Naido. I'm from the Water Research Commission. And I think the way, um, the kind of feedback I'm going to give is related to the fact that as an entity, we work with national department, local departments, water boards, uh, universities, and various institutions, all of which which have different types of data, from water quality to water quantity. And uh, what we found in research is we are doing quite a bit of research on machine learning, on, on new models, on apps and devices. The question is, how do you bring it all together? And where, you know, how does the system actually work cohesively together in order to, to take up some of this research development and innovation that's coming through? From a South African space, in terms of the information society index, we're not very high. So we still are lacking in terms of skills and access, in terms of readiness for the digital transformation space. And so to some extent, you're finding that in the sector, we're doing a lot of pilots around data and data systems, interoperability among systems. And basically, uh, I think for the research space, we're, we're a lot better around analytics, around uh, moving more into the visualization, the reporting, the planning, the forecasting uh, spaces. But what I find, and that's why I asked the question, is that while we may do all of this preparedness, around data and understanding data uh, and getting some of the inter interoperability aspects sorted out. The key aspects that also needs to come from the ecosystem and be aligned and coordinated within the ecosystem is policy. And so while we have policy, the policy doesn't quite unpack all the way through for the water sector. Uh, we still find there's a reluctance around data sharing. Uh, there's uh, there's massive uh, lack of inclusive inclusivity around different data sets, and so we need to unpack that a little bit more, be more, more in, innovative, but also get the the costs down in these spaces uh, because data at the moment is quite expensive. Secondly, around practice, we find that practices that tend to be in the water sector fairly entrenched. So how do we actually open up the space? It is difficult because with this discussion around data automation, sensors, et cetera, 
always comes job security kind of issues. And so that's part of the discussion as we work towards these sort of bigger vision around digital uh, transformation. And from a skills point of view, even with some of the proof of concepts that we are doing, we're finding that people are often asking the question. So, you know, how does my, my organization need to fully change? You know, what do I need to bring on? The data scientists, the, the IT specialists, the network specialists, the, the systems, hardware, software, do, you, do I bring it in house? Do I take it outsourced? Uh, what are the added costs to this whole big vision around digital transformation? Uh, and what are the le also the legal requirements uh, as we man uh, sort of maintain all of these uh, sort of data agreements, et cetera, in, in terms of the digital space? So in that space, and, and I, I mentioned regulations finally, there are regulations around data and, and it's really a question of trying to understand cybersecurity, uh, privacy issues, and a range of other things, especially in the water sector, largely public sector driven, therefore very little incentive to be risky around testing and being more innovative in, in, the, in, the, in the digital space. Thank you. Brilliant, great, thanks very much for that. Um, that was, you're all very concise in, in getting quite a complicated topic over in a, in a short period of time. Um, Valerie, I'm going to start with you, um, a question. So you're talking about how the digitization needs to be inclusive. How are you um, tackling this um, in South Africa to make sure everyone is involved? So I think it's at two levels. Inclusivity is in terms of the key decision makers, in terms of who is involved around where, how we're getting data, where we're sharing it, and uh, in terms of who are we sharing that data with. I think we've got a long way to go in terms of sharing information with society in a more transparent way. And I think that's also part of the reason being in the water sector, certain bits of data is private and, and you have to keep it private. There's trust issues involved there. But I think in society, we're building quite a bit of research projects are working really well on water quality, citizen science type, uh, projects, which is from the grassroots up, uh, where people are actually involved in data collection. The question is, where do you put it? How do we put it into repositories where everyone can gain uh, the, the access to that information? How can we use it more smartly, curate that information, and actually create uh, solid sort of data decision support systems on the ground? And I think with South Africa, we're finding that it's difficult to bring all, all of that together. We can do piecemeal. Now, how do you pull the puzzle together, so to speak? Yeah, totally. Especially when the field is evolving so quickly, making sure that everyone is included at all the stages is tricky. Um, Frank, maybe you can respond to that, how, how we're making sure that the digitization of the water sector is inclusive um, from a kind of European perspective. Well, for, for, for that, uh what we need to push is demonstration for the field. So to progress from field uh, testing solutions and uh, so to really understand what, what are the needs. So not start from the maybe the academic vision, but really work on the field, uh, especially when we speak about interoperability, exchange of information models and, and so on. And quite usually what we, we think from our office and what we face on, on, on the field are, are quite different. And, and even like we, we do, so we build some nice survival model, we, we define some, some maps, some drawings, and when we go on the field, it's quite different. And the way data is consumed, data is produced, data is exchanged, uh, really needs to, to be tested on, on, on the field. And this is the approach that we would try to, to have in, in most of the projects to really start from these use cases and, and, and try to, to profit on the field. Great. Um, so looking at the mural here, um, Tassos, someone has responded to your question um, and where you're talking about this sort of standardization in, in drinking water uh, and how innovative solutions regarding the safety and the security of drinking water can be tested and evaluated in order to have contributions to relevant standards. And someone's put in here about the need for uh, field testing. I just wondered if you wanted to kind of maybe respond to that or expand on your thoughts. I fully, I fully agree on this. Um, actually, the safety and the security of drinking water has to do in general with several security issues. 
So we are talking about disasters, we are talking about uh, other uh, crime activities, and uh, we have to be sure that uh, the solutions that we are going to integrate can should be resilient enough in order to address all these uh, disasters and uh, attacks, uh, whatever. And at the same time, we need to be sure that they are working. So they, are, they actually can measure the, the substances, they can detect uh, specific social media elements about drinking water, etc. So what we definitely need, and I fully agree with Frank, is to, to have these field trials again and again. But we need also to somehow formulate these trials because it is very difficult field it has to do with uh, several other domains it's not like a typical fire it's a, a much more complex disaster event so we need to be sure that the pilot that we are going to to have include all the actors because uh, it involves a lot of actors yeah yeah Great. Um, and going back to the to the mural, um, Atul, we've got uh, three three people have uh, responded to your question here. Um, mm -hmm. And just as a reminder, Atul's question was about um, how is the level of of uh, interoperability <laughs> in your company? Uh, to which extent do you apply standardized common data models? So I'm going to go for the middle question here, which is about how to go beyond data models and add inference capabilities. Well, it is uh, really, really interesting questions. And how beyond data models is just, uh, this is the first step, the initial part of, of, of a big uh, trend in Europe also. Yes, that is just to be a form or to be established uh, data spaces just to, to share data, not only for water, but also for other disciplines, correlates data. And, and also in this correlation of data is how uh, the inference of uh, this uh, data or the provenance of this data could serve just to, for example, detect some extreme events or just to um, reason about the information based on uh, the geography or, or other, um, <clears throat> other um, uh, capabilities or related capabilities for, let me say, for energy or for climate or aligning with different types of data sources. So this is the, the first step uh, that is trendy. Also, uh, based on, on these uh, data models, is also the base just to establish a common representation of data, just to um, promote uh, the proliferation of file driven models, just to be shared across platforms too, based on the same or similar data models. So these are a lot of, of, of opportunities, also linked with the, with, the, with the Frank question is just, this data model, common data models, opens the, the window just to, to generate open interfaces to consume, to explore this data, to create or to easy deploy new uh, new new tools, new services for uh, for the water digital sector. So it is a really really open, really promising uh, thing. Great, yeah. And then I, I just when I was going through this uh, panel discussion, it was making me sort of um, think a bit more broadly about the digitization of the water sector. Um, and obviously it's really exciting, but at the same time, it does have a, a quite a significant environmental footprint. And obviously the EU is wanting to become climate neutral by 2050. So I'm just wondering what are the options to increase the digitization, but also kind of tackle the, the climate emergency? I wonder, Tassos or, or Frank, if you could sort of respond to that. Tassos, do you want to go? Yes. Mm. I think that uh, the, the crucial part uh, in the whole uh, digitization has to do with the different type of, uh, of uh, water utilities. Uh, I think uh, all over Europe, they are completely different. They have completely uh, you know, water facilities, they have completely different uh, um, resources and uh, they have completely different target groups. So uh, in order to be sure that uh, we are going to follow an approach of uh, digitalization and uh, new solutions and uh, 
updates. Uh, I think that we need to make small steps, you know, uh, to make small steps and uh, not to see only the big picture. I think that even for very small utilities in uh, Greece or in Italy or in Bulgaria, we can make small steps in order to further improve their capacity, their resilience, uh, whatever. And at the same time, we can um, benefit from uh, the already existing uh, solutions that uh, large uh, uh, water authorities are using already. So I think that uh, this is the, the, the only way to proceed is to have small steps to, and uh, to be sure to have small goals and that are feasible and uh, we can actually assess them uh, at the end. Yeah. Okay, um, and then looking back at the uh, mural, we've got a couple of questions, a couple of people have responded to your question, Valerie. Um, so just as a reminder, Valerie's question was, um, what opportunities do you think are being missed by the water sector at the moment due to entrenched practice skills, policies or regulations? Um, and we've got one here that's talking about the deep digitization and data federation can lead to new perspectives on the system as a whole. Uh, can you respond to that at all, Valerie? Do you agree with this comment? So I think in, in terms of setting those kind of visions, um, definitely. But I think the you know the issue as as we've just been discussing now is to some extent it's it's quite a big task. You, you're changing quite a bit of stuff. Uh, it is part of the water sector. It is not the water sector. And so when you're bringing in uh, digital. Uh, that piecemeal, the field testing, getting people comfortable, getting people skilled, getting the policies aligned, getting the budgets aligned, all becomes important. But there's no doubt about it that we can actually, if we get to that space, I mean, where digital transformation will take us is even alluding to the question that you asked before, is, is far more better dec decision making with better data around how maybe maybe we can't really stop climate change per se, but we will be responding to it a lot more in future. I mean, in South Africa right now, droughts come far more frequently. And so how do you actually manage your assets, your infrastructure uh, in, a, in as best a way you can? And the only way you can do it is by actually having data, managing that data, understanding, creating the kind of models that gives you the kind of predictive analysis uh, that uh, you know maybe maybe sets you a few steps ahead of of what you're trying to do. But digital is so much bigger than just the water sector. You can go beyond that uh, just with the data, and and also bringing in the data from other sectors, the weather services, the agricultural services. Uh, you know, just general data around populations, etc. Just adds so much more richness around how we analyze the data that we currently do in the water sector. Right. Yeah. And then you've got another question here. Someone else has responded. Um, it says the lack of inter... <laughs> I'm struggling pronouncing this word. Uh, interoperability across the whole water life cycle to provide territorial level decision making. Do you have any responses to that? Uh, that's, a, that's a big one. I mean, that's around governance structures and mandates and as much as you may have two organizations working well, you, you, you actually end up uh, sometimes it depends on the leadership structures within those in entities. Uh, and so uh, this is why I say, even while we're dealing with these pilots and testing the and doing the field studies, you have to always work at integrating the policies, getting the skills aligned, not just within each entity, but across entities. So that the same way we say water sector, uh, water sector professionals have uh, you know, a grouping, you actually need the digital sector professionals having their own grouping that kind of talk across the different institutions as well. So you can bring things closer rather than fighting and, and trying to do everything on your own, because that's, that, that, that would ultimately lead to, I would say, the best um, products that will come from digital, digital transformation, not just for the sector in terms of the way it operates, but the way it shares transparently it's information with its citizens. Yeah, totally. It all has to be very transparent. Um, so we've just got about five minutes left. Um, I'd like to open up the the chat. Really, do you do you would you like to ask each other any questions? And if so, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question to any of your panelists. Any of the panelists. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. It's your turn to ask a question. Yeah, just in terms of, I suppose, uh, the colleagues can answer, but um, standardization of data. You know, where where are you at, at the moment? Because, I mean, while we're doing it at the research level, uh, in terms of moving to the utilities, we're finding that that is, is another step that we'd need to take. Uh, and how are you planning on bringing some sort of harmonization across the entire water sector? Or are you looking at it purely from an entity or utility point of view for standardization at the moment? Who would you like to direct that to? In, any of the colleagues. Any, any, anyone mm. that has experiences. Yeah, maybe I can start. Um, the say it, it really depends even of uh, which country we are talking about. I Means in, in all our project planning projects, we we are working on, on, on data modelization, data modeling uh, for different use cases. There are some um, European initiatives that I talk would mention on SARF and so on, on water. But now, if I look at uh, the French case that I, I, I know better. There is a wool uh, initiative named Sandre in France, which is uh, an obligation or a regulation for, for exchange of water data over all actors in France. Uh, and this is quite well developed, but not pushed at all at the European level because I think each country has its own approach. So it's not only where we position on, on the life cycle, it's not only where we we are on the company or organization type, but it's also, uh, it differs also from country to country. So there is really, this exists, but there are still many, many, many mismatch yet to, to, to be solved, to, to, to come across a rule, let's say European exchange for water, water information. Great. Does anyone else want to add anything? We've got a couple of minutes left. No. Well, well, I think just to complement Frank's uh, answer is just uh, we are working also all together, also having a common data model just to, to enable this harmonization of data across across Europe. And, and one of the enables that we are we are trying or we are pushing up is uh, in the lines of NGS ILD and also the uh, the alignment with Sharep for Water just to to, to, to to bring all the companies just yes, uh, this this data harmonization, this data sharing exploration. So. This is the trend here, let me say, more or less in the water sector in, in Europe. So let, let's see in a couple of years uh, uh, which is the adoption and which is the, the, the development. But this is currently one promising thing to, to having also reference architecture for, 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 that, for data gathering and data exploitation, let me say, or uh, gathering new insights from data. Great. And I'm afraid that's all we've got time for now. Um, so everyone, uh, the audience are giving a nice round of applause. Thanks so much for being so concise and, and also uh, uh, engaging this discussion now. Thank you so much. And next up, uh, we have our keynote uh, speaker um, who is in the um, waiting room. Um, so we've got Dr. Philip uh, Quivalivia, from the European Commission, who is giving a keynote talk on the science policy interactions and standardization in the water sector. Now, we won't have time for questions, but I encourage you to use the uh, Q&A function where you'll be able to ask a question and Philippe will be able to, to respond. So uh, without further ado, Philippe, you've got 10 minutes. This stage is, is all yours, so over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. I will try to share my yeah. my slides, and, or or maybe yeah, if yeah, it's all. So I, I, I bet if you could if you could actually click when I will request. Actually, uh, is, there are animations. Very happy to be to be with you uh, for for a very short while. I will I would like actually to simply um, um, the overall framework of the. And water policy regarding safety and security, because I hear a lot of uh, things uh, being discussed be, uh, among research. So I just, I want to just, just to remind a little bit where we are standing at, at your level. So if you could click on the slides, Brett, if you could open, open the slides. Yeah, so. Um, uh, uh, it's no, no need to, to make, to put the animation, yeah, pass the
Yeah, thank you very much. I don't, I don't see. Yeah. Okay. I see, uh... <laughs> it's a little bit. Uh, it's disappearing. Appearing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you can you can, can uh, pass this one line and then click because it, time, time will be. Yeah. You can click. To, to continue to click. I want first to speak about the need to pull it to. Mission among safety and security because there is a, a clear ambiguity even at policy level among safety and security. And regarding safety, it's quite clear that we have a, a wide range of policy which is which are ruled by the Water from a Directive and they are concerning uh, flood issues, um, priority substances, groundwater, bathing water, uh, urban wastewater. This is clearly related to the quality, the safety of the water. So we are not speaking here about security, even if there is a slight actually confusion with water security regarding the water resource availability because of comments in agriculture when they speak about water I would say intentional poisoning, for example. So we speak about here about availability. And there is a clear link the climate adaptation strategy regarding uh, natural disasters, for example, uh, regarding um, drought and, and flood. Regarding uh, the inter internal uh, security strategy, here we are really clearly speaking about intentional threats. Security regarding criminal acts or terrorism. Different mechanisms, and in particular the CBRN, Chemical, Biological, Radiological, nec uh, Nuclear Action Plan, but also issues related to critical infrastructure. And it's, uh, for example, the project Stop It is is, uh, is inside. And, and here, the animals are different because you are speaking with environmental policies on one side and on security policies. And the ministries are different and, and are not necessarily establishing dialogue between uh, Ministry of Interior and Environment. If you could move to the next slide, please. And you can you can skip the, the animation just yeah so the research challenging i'll yeah, come back the research challenge, challenges are, are numerous and we are trying to establish synergies among among the different uh, type of research related to safety and security which are uh, as uh, tassos mentioned um, uh, including a lot of different actors policy makers research industry practitioners civil society and so on and we have different type of tools which are being developed which are maybe related to technologies monitoring tools and so on which may be actually relevant to both safety and security and standardization which is that we are looking at regarding uh, research which is either um, i would say the upstream activities of uh, related to standardization that is pre or conormative research uh, harmonization which is for example related to standard operating procedures but which are not formal standards and even standards so this is something which is also quite confusing at uh, at international level um, uh, understanding that iso or en standards related to water safety obviously exist but there are none regarding water security for a simple reason is that water security aspects are uh, very often classified the standards cannot contain classified information so we are a little bit stuck in this respect regarding the two aspects of safety and security next slide please i will try to make it quick to our uh, yeah, so just, just to say that we have a full legacy of project to water security. We are looking in the program where I'm working on civil society for security uh, regarding uh, this. Well, uh, just, just for you to know, next slide, please. And Aquas 3S is one of them. And just click on, on the DR. So this is a, a apparently complex slide, but I wanted just to say that we are on the one side, the research uh, environment, the research community, which is uh, obviously trying to establish synergies between different fields. The policy on the other side, on the right side, which is also struggling to, I would say, uh, integrate their different issues related to Okay, do you want me to, do you want to put me on the main, oh, oh, I think we had, I think we had a bit of a connection issue there. 
Um, I'm afraid. I think we're going to have to leave Philippe's talk there, but Philippe is still online. So if you have any questions, um, then do use the Q&A um, to ask Philippe um, any questions that you may have on that presentation. That's such a shame because it's such an interesting um, dis discussion going on there. But yeah, do do use the live Q&A because I think Philippe is still online, but there was a connection issue. Um, we will now take a, a comfort break. Um, so we've got an extra five minutes. So if you come back at 1.40, uh, UK time. So go make a cup of tea or a coffee, get a biscuit, and um, we'll see you back at 1.40 UK time.
Um, oh, we're in the preview room. Okay, great. Can people on the main talking here? No. Okay. Cool. All right. Hello. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you feel a little bit rested and I hope you got a coffee or a tea. Um, we have got Philippe, who's going to just um, finish off his presentation, uh, just kind of wrap it up, because it was a shame we had technical issues. So, Philippe, would you like to join me on the main stage just to talk to me, for, uh, to finish off your presentation? With pleasure, yeah. I wanted actually simply to, to wrap up a little bit. I stressed the issues among water safety and security, the links with research standardization, which are quite complex. And I, I, uh, I simply highlighted that we um, gathering different factors, yeah. uh, policy uh, researchers, SME uh, people, industry, civil society, and, and first responders. And, and I wanted simply to invite uh, the attendees community willing to be informed and the type of conclusions that we are doing. And my last slides was about to become a Great, Brett, do you want to share the link? And then you will regularly receive information that you are free to, to attend. So it's, it's worth simply my purpose. Great, we're just going to get Brett to share the last slide so everyone um, can see the contact details there. Yeah. So um, if you're interested in learning more, then do do, do check this out. And um, you've got Philippe's uh, contact details there. And I think Philippe's going to hang, hang around for a little bit longer. Um, so do use the Q&A or just email, email him directly. Great, thanks so much. So we're, we're yeah. now going to um, whiz on to the next question. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to move on now to um, uh, to, pr pr to have a winner on the stage. We've got a uh, five F water challenge um, uh, is doing a hackathon, um, which was for data scientists that was all to do with the water digitization process. So we've got 10 minutes to hear from the Tara Borobinski, who's going to be going through um, his uh, hackathon. So would you like to come onto the stage? And you've got 10 minutes. And please do um, use the Q&A to interact and ask any questions. Sure. So thank you, Kay. Hi, everyone. It's an honor to be here speaking to you. I'm going to talk. Let's see if I can share my screen properly. Are you seeing the presentation? Wait a second. Yeah. Can you see the presentation? Yeah, I can do it from my, my end. Yeah. Uh, can you, are you listening to me? Yep, it's good. Oh. Yeah. I can barely hear you. Sorry. Yeah, it's sharing. You should be able to see it. Great. Uh, all right. No. Wait. Ah, okay. There you go. Uh, so the name of my project, this name, name that you're seeing there, um, I'm representing both Fiverr and ISA, the water company in Argentina that provides water to 14 million Argentinians. Uh, okay. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So what was the problem that I had to solve? Uh, CAP, which is the public company in Milan, Italy, responsible for providing water to around 2.5 million people in the Piri urban area of, of Milan, and um, added a lot of sensors uh, to, the, to the more than 60 wastewater treatment plants. Um, in order to, you know, to get the information about the wastewater, 
um, but along with the huge amount of sensors, along with the huge amount of data, they need to do something with that data to process the data and, and to extract some information from it. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. So the, the main goal was to switch, like to replace uh, lab data, to replace the lab with the sensors. Why? Because uh, so far, what they did was to take a sample, a daily sample from the water, and that way they got the information about the water. Um, and sensors allow, allow it to, to get a real-time data uh, about the water. It's more accurate, it's, it's cheaper, you need less people. So, so that was the main goal. And then how to, next slide please. Thank you. So what was the data? First of all, on the one hand, we had the lab data, which was all together, uh, would, uh, it contained information uh, about the, um, you know, the, the concentration of different substances in the water. Uh, and the important thing here is that laboratory data is the reference to monitor the quality of real-time data, meaning that since the only data that we had was the lab data, uh, we take that as the reality, as the, as, you know, as the truth. So in order to validate data, in order to validate sensor data, we have to compare it with lab data, all right? Uh, and on the other hand, we had the sensor data, which was not all together, but divided in by, by plants, by water treatment plants, and properties, uh, COD, which is uh, chemical oxygen demand, and different substances in the water. So we had to pre-process the data, put it all together in order to be able to validate it, uh, meaning to compare it with the lab data. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the thing, the picture that you're seeing there is a, of a sample and, um, you know, we needed to compare, the, to make the data equal in, in a way so we can, so we could compare it against, so we could validate uh, the sensor data and comparing it with lab data. Uh, and in order to pre-process the data, we had to make daily averages uh, because as I said, sensor data provides you with, uh, real-time data, while a sample, you take it once a day. So we decided, I decided to make a daily average of the of sensor data to be able to, to compare, you know, apples with apples. Next slide, please. Uh, and then regarding the pre-processing of the data, um, I had to choose, I mean, the, the ideal thing is to take sliding windows, as you can say, uh, as you can see the, there, sorry, as you can see there, and uh, not day by day, but to take, I don't know, four or five days in a sliding window and make an average or compare like windows of days. But, next slide, please. Uh, but uh, the data that was provided to us uh, was non-continuous, so, uh, there could be a gap of a week or, or two weeks or one day between the data of one day and the, the other. So uh, the best thing here with this data available was to take values, take uh, day, uh, singular days. All right, next slide. Now we move to the correlation calculation. We, we had to compare, we have to validate the sensor data uh, and the best idea we thought was to calculate the correlations between sensor data and lab data, which again was like the truth, like the, the reality. Uh, and next slide. Thank you. And th this is the results that we got. Hope that you can see them, but in case you can't, I, uh, the important thing here is that we are the number, the, the correlation uh, for every plant and for every substance that you can see listed there. Um, and um, a high correlation meant that the sensors were doing a nice job with that substance in that plant, 
for example, in the AAA plant, in the plant AAA with the chemical oxygen demand. And a low correlation meant that, uh, you know, there's an opportunity for improving that sensor. Next slide. We used Pearson's correlation. So if you don't like mathematics or statistics, you can stop listening to me for like a minute or so. Why Pearson's correlation, which is like the standard way of calculating correlations. Next slide. Because, uh, sorry for the ones who don't like math, you, don't, you just don't get it. Uh, so in other ways of calculating correlations, you use, I mean, there are rank correlations in which you don't take only the values, you take that like the ranking of, um, of the values. In this case, the value, the percentage, the concentration of the different substances in the water. So since there were a lot of ties, mainly for values that were like, I don't know, lower than 15 milligrams per liter or lower than 10 milligrams per liter, since there were a lot of ties, and these kinds of correlations uh, of coefficients work with ranks. You can see a lot of R, a lot of ranks. Uh, since we have a lot of ties, we decided to take um, Pearson's coefficient, which only takes values. Next slide, please. You. All right, now we move to the clustering analysis. Um, clustering is a way to group um, different data in clusters, in groups, according to their similarity. And we make like similarity groups and uh, ideally two data that are similar will be in the same cluster in the same group and two data that are different will be in different groups. It's something I mean, simple to, to, to gauge the idea, to get the idea. Next slide. Thank you. So, for example, we, we would have three clusters, say, and in the in, in the cluster zero, we would maybe have a water that is almost clean that needs a, a, a low amount of chlorine or whatever to 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 be able to re reuse. Cluster one, something intermediate. Cluster two, water that is barely impossible to clean. Something like that. I mean, the idea is to, uh, for me as a person who is not an expert in water, but in data, only in data, and be able to divide the water according to its uh, components to, to have different groups of water. Uh, and then an specialist could say, okay, this water is clean, this water is not, and, and with the hope of in the future classifying water behaviors into one of those clusters. Next slide. We use the K-means algorithm, uh, again, for algorithm for uh, data science lovers, uh, mainly because um, we could take the outliers manually. It was easy to see them, and we didn't want to trust an algorithm to, to take the outliers and stuff, like make it short. Next slide, because so, I'm running out of time. So in order to see outliers, we made a box diagram and some other stuff. Next slide, getting into the details. Uh, then we calculated the silhouette uh, coefficient to see what was the right amount of clusters. Uh, in clustering, you um, you need to uh, to you don't know what number of groups or clusters you will have in the end, but there's a mathematical way of calculating it uh, thanks to silhouette uh, the silhouette um, coefficient. I'm not going to get into this too much. Next slide. Finally, we got actually three clusters. Math said uh, three was the right number of clusters. So there you can see the different features. I mean, that's the way the clusters look, uh, generally speaking. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Last, and here the fiber uh, platform or infrastructure, uh, infrastructure comes in. Um, then we, we had to export the model into Bento ML, which uh, Bento ML is a, a, a machine learning, a it's a framework for serving, managing, and deploying machine learning models. Bento ML gives you many ways to export the model. Uh, and the most common one among Python uh, users is using Pico, which is a module for serializing 
Python objects. Um, and um, okay, next slide. How does the fiber for water architecture integration work? Uh, uh, first of all, take into account that NGSILD is the standard European API or interface for context information. It's mainly in Internet of Things and smart cities and all the things that fiber is about. Mainly, um, once you exported the model and imported it into Bento ML uh, using the um, NGSILD as as the interface, um, you have the communication between the user and the and Bento ML, and and the important thing here is ah sorry, now the important thing here is that the, I'm just about to finish. The, the the user provides the the data. The I'm sorry, the the user chooses um, which model he wants to use. For example, if, you, if they want to use my the, the model that I made, and um, and BentoML is responsible for taking the data and, and providing the results to the user. So next slide, please. So uh, in this case, the sensor uh, sends the we have a sensor and in terms of thing in IoT sensor could be uh, the, one of the sensors in the water treatment plants uh, in Milan. It sends the data and the data is uh, transformed through the NGSILD, through the API. And uh, that way, that way the user gets the results. I mean, um, the BentoML subscribes to the con context broker to get the data and the user subscribes to the content broker to get the results. The content broker is a broker. It's like a mediator uh, between user and data and I, uh, IoT sensors or whatever. And I'm going to have to wrap up. Are you, are you, do you want to yeah. quickly finish off? Is that the last sure. slide? Wrapping up, the, a container is, or a process is sent and uh, it waits for the API to receive the data. Uh, last, uh, Bento, Bento ML allows time series management, which is important. So you have a, like a window of data uh, to do the analysis and not only the last result. That's Brilliant. very much it. Yeah. Thank you, uh, thanks so much. Um, fortunately, we don't have time for questions, but Toro, that was brilliant, and congratulations uh, on on winning the hackathon. I think you're going to hang around a little bit. If so, if you've got questions, then there's the live Q and A. Um, so if you've got any questions, then do do use the Q and A function, and Toro will um, will respond. So we're now um, whizzing on to the uh, final. Uh, panel discussion. So we've got a good 30 minutes um, to discuss um, about the cybersecurity strategies and social engagement of the digital water transition. Now, it's unsurprising that the water sector is really enthusiastic about the digital transformation. However, it's really important to reflect on the complexities, the tensions and the potential unintended consequences of the digital transformation. Now, we've got another uh, fantastic uh, panel of speakers and we're going to follow the same format in that each of them are going to be given three minutes um, to talk through uh, the question. They've all been given a question um, and I encourage you to respond to the question on Mural. Um, Brett, who is doing a fantastic job on the tech side, will um, post that in the chat. So do respond to their questions on the mural. I'm now going to give a, a brief overview to all the speakers, and then I'll uh, invite the first speaker to the stage. So um, we've got Dr. Theodora Sekrika, who's from the Center for Research and Technology at Halas. She is a computer scientist and specializes in information retrieval and data mining with a particular focus on AI technologies and security, cyber security applications. We've then got Dr. Richard Ellerman. He is the head of politics at Eurocat Technology Center. He is a political analyst who specializes in environmental 
and scientific policy and the links between politics, the world of research and development and citizen engagement. And then we've got uh, Dr. Natasha Amorzi from the Office of International Delieu. She is part of the coordination team of the European project Fireware for Water, where she leads the ecosystem building for communication and dissemination strategies and activities. Very important job. We've then got Gonzalo Meshengizana, who's a physician specializing in health systems from UBA, and he has a master's in international cooperation from the University of Santiago de Compostela. And he currently works as the foreign affairs manager at um, the Argentine Water and Sanitation, which is a state owned company of Argentina. Now, I'm speakers, I'm going to be really strict on time. You've only got three minutes to talk through your question. Um, and each of you will come in um, in order. I won't come in between all of you. So you'll just go through in the role and then we'll all come together um, at the end and have a nice chat. So first of all, can I invite uh, Theodora to the stage? So thank you very much, uh, Kate, uh, for this invitation. So my question pertains to cybersecurity, which is one of the most important uh, implications of digital transformation. And uh, I think we can all see how cybersecurity is coming to the forefront um, of all um, efforts for digital transformation. And um, it's becoming more and more relevant also to the water sector, uh, as there have been some um, uh, cybersecurity incidents that are quite high profile during uh, the last uh, few years. And this range, um, these are quite diverse actually. So they range from attempts to interfere with um, the chemicals in the water, the, waters the water levels and so on, um, up to try to infringe upon the privacy of uh, customers and um, uh, get access to their data, information, personal data, and even bug details. So as we can see, the attack surface is, is quite uh, large. And um, in, uh, not only in the water sector, but also in other uh, critical infrastructures, because um, on the one hand, we have the inherent uh, vulnerabilities of uh, industrial control systems, SCADA protocols, and so on. And on the other hand, there is the convergence between cyber and uh, physical, and also the interconnection with the IoT. Uh, so, although cybersecurity uh, awareness and preparedness has been increasing um, over the last decade or so, and even more so in the last couple of years with the COVID situation that has forced us to move a, a large part of our lives uh, online, um, and reports, for instance, by NISA have shown that, it's not so clear whether this is also the case in the uh, in the security, in, sorry, in the in the waste, uh, water, and water sectors, and uh, even if there is an increased um, um, awareness of cybersecurity, there are still some uh, obstacles to to overcome. That it's it's not difficult to um, it, it sorry it's it's not easy to to address them because cybersecurity is a multidimensional problem. It does not only have a technology dimension, so it's not sufficient to say, okay, let's put some cutting edge uh, uh, technologies, cybersecurity solutions, and the, the problem will be solved. Uh, it needs to address the relationship between technology, operators, uh, operations, and vulnerabilities. So the human factor also comes in, and um, uh, it, because it, it's quite critical. Um, uh, in in all uh, cybersecurity solutions to to be able to um, both inform uh, users, so either personnel but also uh, the end users, the customers of the cybersecurity risks that are um, uh, available, and um, and uh, I, as we all know that there are a lot of, of such uh, attempts. On the other hand, there is also a shortage of, of skills. In the, yeah, I'm wrapping up. So okay. um, uh, one of the main obstacles, as I said, there's both lack of awareness, lack of tools, lack of trained uh, personnel and, uh, and uh, some other aspects that I would like to hear in the, 
in the comments and apologies for the video link. So thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Richard Lellerman. My big hobby horse, shall we say, is citizen engagement. And when we talk about digital transformation and everybody goes, oh, water loves digital transformation. And I would say rubbish, water hates digital transformation when it comes to relating to its consumers. It may love it when it means that they have to do less work actually in their water treatment plants. Um, but utilities are extremely conservative organizations. The digital sector itself regards water as a very, very limited market. So what does this mean from a political point of view? What does this mean from an engagement perspective? I think it's absolutely essential that everybody in the world becomes aware of the issue of water, both at a global level, but also at an individual's local level. I think, therefore, it's the only way of creating interest. And if you create interest, then you can engage the citizen. And I'm not referring to citizen science. I have nothing against citizen science. I was listening with interest to uh, some of the presenters before me talking about factors of citizen science. But citizen science is limited to the time of a specific study led by researchers. And it's a very much a top bottom exercise. You could almost say it's using citizens to give you free data. What I mean by engagement is where we give a responsibility to the citizen, to the man in the street, to the non-water professional, and make them an active actor in the subject of water. And to do that, we need at a local level to really involve all the members of what we call in politics the quintuple helix. The public sector, the private sector, the research sector, citizens themselves, and culture. Culture is very important to be able to create an emotional reaction on the part of the hitherto uninformed layman. The digital revolution for me is extremely important, but I'm not referring to smart meters, which also obviously have their importance, or I'm not referring either to the more efficient, uh, shall we say, management of a wastewater treatment plant. What I'm referring to are the amazing possibilities that we have to incorporate the citizen into giving them the active responsibility for co-creating policies of water, of co-creating awareness campaigns, and above all, in co-creating systems in order to enhance water management. Is that possible? That's where my question comes in. Would water companies, would public administrations be prepared to give that responsibility to citizens? Obviously not from a technical point of view, nobody would suggest that. What I'm suggesting is that we give them both a supervisory role and at the same time we give them a communications and a dissemination role to the rest of their community for the projects which they themselves have co-created. We can use these days so many different tools such as virtual reality, augmented reality, and we have become to really demonstrate the possibilities of a far more open democracy when it comes to water. The World Water Quality Alliance Social Engagement Program, which I lead, is already doing this. And the project Fireware for Water has demonstrated this very clearly in the town of Great Torrington in southwest England, Absolutely. where southwest Absolutely. water themselves have been able to demonstrate that they can work with their customers. And again, as well in Amsterdam. So I leave that question open to you and look forward to any future questions, uh, be they written or spoken. Move little the discussion towards is what standardization expertise is needed next to provide a full operational package for digital water. Here's the kind of question that, uh, you can obtain from an, a social economist, uh, economic, uh, economical perspective. Uh, I'm Natasha Morsi. I'm working at the International Office for Water and I've fallen into the digital uh, water world a few years ago with the Fewer for Water European, European project. And there is, it has already been uh, slightly presented and where I'm leading the uh, 
activities on communication, dissemination, and what is probably of most interest here on exploitation. We have had some very nice exchanges on the standardization, the data innovation, which have highlighted the huge potential of uh, digital water to tackle societal challenges, as it has been mentioned, related to climate change, to popul population growth, sorry, the pollution, as well as issues that all increase the pressure on water. But somehow, if we have a critical view, uh, what is really happening? Why are these solutions not fully operational yet? Uh, what I would like to highlight here is that the technical expertise does exist and is ready to support the water stakeholders in the management and in the use of water. But probably what also comes into place and have been raised so far with the other presentation is along the way with the scientific and technological solution, there is a huge need to involve and combine additional uh, dimensions to be to combine those technical solutions with the government's tool and mechanisms that will provide the appropriate context for stakeholders to implement those solutions, as it has been referred just before by by Richard, and integrate uh, those solutions in their management, change their, you know, uh, support the, the shift of management uh, in the field of water. It is one, it is one dimension, dimension that is quite important along with the scientific and technological solution. Another aspect that also has been mentioned a bit earlier, but I think it's quite uh, pertinent again to rehearse it, is the training and capacity effort to, for this solution, uh, so those solutions, sorry, are understood, integrated, and used to tackle the stakeholder needs in a standalone way. Uh, we have, uh, we are uh, at the starting of a transition, but then the transition should also lead to autonomous uh, management and use of this solution by the by the stakeholders. And uh, last but not uh, the least, uh, what needs to be combined as well with the technical uh, solution in the field of digital water as the economic drivers to ensure that those solutions are financial uh, financial, financially available and sustainable. Uh, combining digital water solution with the governance, the capacity building and economic dimensions uh, led us to the social uh, innovation, which appears to be very determinant and a key aspect to operational uh, digital, digital water. So behind the question, that's what I had in mind, all those dimensions and would like to uh, uh, see what are your point of views uh, on that. Hello, Kate. Uh, pleased to meet you. Thank you very much for inviting us to be part of this panel. Uh, I understand you want to know if we are aware about cybersecurity uh, among Latin America in our region. First of all, I want to explain uh, what is happening in water utilities in the region. As you know, America Latina is a very big uh, region in the world. We are 21 countries in which uh, more than 600 million people live. Uh, we are uh, the second largest utility in the region. Uh, I mean ISA in Argentina. The first one is Avespi in Brazil. And apart from, from them, we have 120 big water and sanitation utilities in the region. So you have an outlook of what is happening regarding to cybersecurity in the region. Let me share with you some figures. In the first place, uh, out of 21 countries, only 12 uh, has uh, cyber security government uh, or, poli or public political uh, program. Uh, on the other hand, uh, cyber crime and threat metrics uh, told us that we have a level one immaturity regarding to cyber security. 
And in the last one, I want to tell you that uh, cybersecurity was one of the five most uh, worst uh, look into Google last year. So not only the companies, but the, the people it, itself is worried about this. Um, regarding to what is happening in, in water utilities in the region, let me tell you that uh, from the beginning of the pandemic of COVID-19, the cyber attacks grow uh, around 50% in the region. Fishing, uh, uh, pumps, uh, modifications, of rubber working, uh, frauds of different kinds. We suffer a lot from, from this issue. And we think that the, the, the main problem is that our leaders are not uh, aware of this problem. So we, a lack of uh, professionals specialized in, in cyber security, budget to be addressed to this problem to be solved uh, so at this moment uh, all the water utilities in the region are working together to build the kind of I'm master that plan the, you have three minutes i'm being really strict on time just to make sure we've got time to all discuss together so if we can get everyone all the panelists on the main stage um and we can we can um continue um, this discussion it's really interesting what's happening in latin america that's amazing that the cyber attacks have increased so dramatically um so we'll, let's keep uh, on that theme what um what is the water sector doing to try and prevent this from happening in the future how are they trying to reduce these cyber attacks well uh we have what we mean aloas aloas is the association of what are you at this moment, we are uh, working in, a, in an assessment to hold the utilities in the region to prevent new cyber attacks. Beyond that, we are trying to get some funding from multilateral banks in the region, as IDB or the World Bank, to build the system, uh, the utility from the cyber attacks. Yeah. So, Theodora, I just wonder if I could bring you in here because you were talking about cybersecurity as well. I was just wondering, is there a country that is sort of leading the way um, in terms of cybersecurity? Um, in the region? Ah, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, to Theodora, yeah. Um, I think it, it, it depends. I think there is, there is a, a lot of um, uh, research and work being done in the U.S., so they, they have a, a better picture of, of the landscape there. This is, this is my impression. So there, there are a lot of, uh, of reports, regulations, and, and so on. Uh, but also in, uh, in Europe, I would say the more northern uh, European countries. Because the, the, one of the main challenges here is that uh, there are a lot of legacy systems. So it's, um, this is one of the really weak uh, points in the in the chain and in cyber security as in many other uh, cases you are as strong as the weakest link and if you have legacy systems and uh, you are not um, they are not even protected by firewalls uh, firewalls and uh, so on so there, there is a lot of, uh, of vulnerabilities there and as I was saying the attack surface is, is very large so you want to attack the quality of the water or you want to attack the customer themselves so it's it's um, it, it's it's a large, a very diverse uh, problem to to address. Yeah, and of course, um, linking on to Richard, you you are very passionate about making sure that communities are included in the sort of digitization process. Um, so thinking about the digital water services and government governance, um, who and what is currently being excluded from the digital water services and government? What needs to be improved, do you think? Well, basically everything needs to be improved, which is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate, Kate. Because <laughs> there's no attempt from an elected representative to want to go into open democracy 
which means that instead of being a representative uh, system, you would have, uh, shall we say, a co-creation system, an open democratic system. And I think that water is like all of the UEFA nexus, and I think this is very important within the scenario of what's coming up with COP26 and with climate change, that we accept that just having uh, laws and regulations dictated to us by the elected representatives, or in many countries, the non-elected representatives, and the water utilities themselves, who do not, in general, and I don't include cases such have come up today, nor do I certainly include uh, Southwest Water and our other partners in the, in the Fireware for Water Consortium, but many of them do not even intend to, to communicate with their citizens. Some of the extremely large corporations certainly don't want to share their decision-making, uh, which might affect their profits. And this, of course, comes down to a question of, well, is that water, our most basic resource, is still very much in the hands of private industry and private economic, uh, shall we say, uh, globe. I think it's absolutely essential that we do include everybody, every part of society, as I said before, uh, in the discussion about water, but more essentially in co-creation, because then that gives us continuity. The digital transformation permits that. It does permit a very, very easy form of communication between all sectors of society almost at any time. And it does permit that participation. However, I still have my serious doubts whether beyond European projects, when companies are funded to do so, I still have my doubts whether or not uh, the water sector as a whole has the intention to do that. And if it doesn't, we will all be paying the consequences in the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, um, I'd like to bring you in, Natasha, because you, you have a really interesting role because you you um, lead the sort of ecosystem building for communication and dissemination strategies. And so you're in that pivotal role where you're working with the academics and with industry and making sure that everyone is communicating. Um, what have you learned from this role? Is it tricky to... Um, ensure that researchers uh, realize the importance of engaging with communities? Yeah, that's, I like the way the, the question is asked, but I will answer very with precaution because I know that scientists are all around the, the world and the, <laughs> in the session. But I think, yes, it refers, you know, to the understanding, the, the probably the being at the interface is really a matter of understanding the needs on the one hand and what can be proposed. And uh, usually uh, when you start, if we take the very simple and practical example of the project, when you start a project, you realize even in the community, um, the scientific community, the wording needs to be shared. And then probably, you know, this co-creation can start really from the understanding of each other. And uh, that's a, a very first step that sometimes can take time and is not necessarily perceived as very important. But then when you move to the thematic of digital water, the understanding of the needs and the uh, expression on the needs on one hand and how the scientific community can tackle those needs, it's quite a, a big challenge. And we have taken quite some time within fewer for Water, you know, to understand on the partner perspective what is uh, under construction to be really able, while uh, with the work of uh, Richard, the requirement needs was also expressed and be bridging the two together. So it takes time and it is probably something that is also very related to the scale you are addressing your issues, the project scale, but the regional scale. And that is that it has been mentioned, you know, the when you go from the local to the European, then it's also all those different uh, aspects that needs to be taken uh, along. Yeah, definitely. And it's when engaging with communities, no community is the same. So you can have a lovely method that will work in one place and then you try and exactly. use it somewhere else. And it no, but work. probably we can do, you know, a uh, um, similarity, a parallel with the uh, interoperability you were mentioning that could work and the digital solution could work somewhere, but not somewhere else. But what we uh, often forgot to think about, it, it could also work because of the people around the solution. And then we need to rebuild that as well uh, somewhere else. So this transferability could be applied as well to the people, like this engagement aspect, as well to the, to the solution. Yeah. I may just add there, I think that 
the objective must always be the same no matter what you're talking whether it's western europe eastern europe um africa america south america it doesn't matter but the mechanisms must be flexible to be able to adapt to the local approach because what we're really talking about here is the transition of supranational objectives such as the sdgs of the un or the green transition or the twin transition of the european union into local fact and it's only through municipalities and through local water utilities that we will be able to actually achieve this and just going back to the cyber security because i know gonzalo and theodore you were uh, thinking about cyber security do you think um that could be uh, something that would put people off or communities feeling very wary about the digitization of the water sector if um you know our data is not protected I could say that this is not like particular to the water sector. So if they have such concerns, it applies to all other um, sectors in, in their lives. So what, whatever kind of data protection you would apply to the water sector, you would apply to other sectors. So this particular aspect, the user privacy, uh, it's not particular to, to the water sector, but of course it needs to be addressed because it involves more sensitive also um, uh, data and also financial data in, in many cases. Yeah, definitely. So we've got about five minutes left. I'm just wondering if um, either of you have questions for each other. Um, I've been asking all the questions, so do, do feel free if you, if you would like to probe each other with a question. Well, I, I can ask you for advice regarding to digitalization. As I told you before, maybe our region is is the the less developed regarding to this issue. So we are open to discuss it further in the future. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you our worries about it. Yeah, well, thanks very much for sharing. I think that's the benefits of these um, online conferences is that it's a lot more accessible for people to join from from all around the world. Um, well, I would just like to I would just like to take the occasion to to encourage everybody to think beyond water. Uh, I think that this is one of the problems within the water sector. Uh, all of the actors, be they researchers or professionals or utilities or in, include governmental agencies that they are very much siloed, thinking only exclusively of water, when they should be thinking of the nexus together with energy, with food, mm -hmm. with the ecosystems, and the principal role that water has, but the fact that water has never figured among the, uh, shall we say, the central issues, the central debates of climate change, is due to the fact that water itself is far too hermetic to the other shall we say, factors regarding climate change, such as the welfare nexus. And I think that water as well, if it assumes that role, will also become central to science diplomacy, which is going to be essential over the next 30 years, as the pressures of climate change also convert into problems of migration and uh, conflict and indeed gender inequality in a lot of regions of the world, such as South America, but also the region which I represent here in the Mediterranean. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, it's. I totally agree. It's. It's trying to. Um, yeah, it's all about collaboration, isn't it? And um, getting out of those silos, which which is tricky, because um, of the different languages and you know, uh, being able to understand each other. Um, but it's so important to to communicate with each other. So um, I think we'll we'll call it a day there, so everyone can have a quick break um, before coming back. Um, at uh, 2.40. But I just want to say a big thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate the time and thanks so much for um, presenting your question. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Kate. Kate. Thank you. Yeah. See you soon. Bye-bye.